know what day it is? I'll tell you what day it is. This is the day that the Lord have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I certainly hope that you had a great Thanksgiving holiday, that you were thankful in spite of, not because of, but in spite of COVID-19, not been able to have big Thanksgiving dinner. You didn't do it, did you? Uh, and we should still be thankful. All right. Now let's get on down to the lesson. As you know, we're in the series and the series is entitled Called. And I think, let's see, lesson one, it was called to believe. Lesson two was called to be a vessel. And now we are going to do the lesson called to be an heir. All right. So <clears throat> if there. Well, let me put it this way. Many people don't like to read the Old Testament. And I'm telling you, you, you are doing yourself a disservice if you don't read the Old Testament. Because then the New Testament doesn't really uh, uh, tell you like it should. Are you be as grateful for the New? And the reason that they don't like to read the Old Testament is because of names. And you can get in the Old Testament and you turn to one of those books and it's going to give you a list of this one begot that one and this one begot that one. And so we don't like to read that. I mean, you stop and think, who going to preach that? Who going to read that? Who? You definitely don't want to teach it, don't want to preach it. And yet when we come to the first chapter in the first book, of the New Testament, what do you have? You got all of these begots. Well, and this is the genealogy of Jesus that we see in Matthew chapter 1. And there are two important reasons to have uh, Jesus' genealogy in the Bible, too. The first one is that we have the genealogy of Jesus Christ to establish an important truth. Now, hear me now. Our faith is rooted in history and not in myth or legend. Now, you might notice there are two different genealogies in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament. One is in Matthew and the other one is in Luke. Now, Matthew, he is writing to the Jews, and in his genealogy, he starts at Abraham and go forward uh, to the birth of Jesus. And you can find that in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 through 17. Now, Luke, who is writing to the Gentiles, he goes backwards. He goes backwards from Jesus' birth back not to Abraham, but all the way back to Adam. And you can find that in Luke uh, chapter 3, verse 23 through 38. Now, most people believe that Matthew is recording the line of Joseph. Matthew showed that Jesus was legally in the kingly land of David, because Matthew is writing his gospel to the Jews, and he wants them to understand that Jesus is the one, the king that God had promised that's coming through the line of David. And so, therefore, we see that he legally in the kingly land of David. Now, in Matthew chapter 1, there are 39 begots. This one, we got that one. But the most important one is not in Matthew chapter 1. Because Matthew is careful not to make the claim that Jesus was the biological son of Joseph. In fact, he chooses his words very carefully when he says, Jacob the father of Joseph, 
the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. He is very meticulous in giving you this um, line up like that by saying of whom Jesus was born, showing that Joseph was not the biological or physical father of Jesus. But still, it was important that Jesus be shown to have legal claim to the throne of David. Are you with me? Through the father's side, because that's where it has to come from, is the father's side. And this was true because he was legally Joseph's oldest son. So Matthew establishes the legal claim to the throne that Jesus had. Now, secondly, that was the first. And let me tell you, while I should have warned you at the very top that you might need to get yourself some highlighters and pen and pencil or paper and paper, pen or pencil, whichever one you like to use, and paper because you might want to keep a few little notes. Let me just say that over the next several lessons. If you don't have pencil and paper, when you get ready to tune in for the Sunday school lesson, make sure you have your Bible, you have the lesson, and you know you can go to the, if you don't have the St. Stephen app, get the app, it's free, just go to the app store and, and, and download it and have the app and you can go to the eCampus where it says um, hump day and there you can get the lesson because you're going to need it over these because we're going to stop uh, doing the fluff and stuff. And we need to really see what Christmas is all about. And we did that. I, I hope that you got that when we talked about call to believe and called to be a vessel. And now we call to be an heir. This is, uh, uh, this is important, so get your pen or pencil, your highlighter, your Bible, and some scratch paper, okay? Now, so let me get back. Uh, second, the second point why it's important that we have this genealogy of Jesus in the Scripture, and that's the greatest point, because his genealogy shows the outcast in his lineage. Woo! <laughs> oh, talk of to me. In other words, we will see that Jesus has skeletons in his closet. And many of us, we don't want to open up our closet because we don't want people to know that we've got some drunks, we got some, some drug addicts, we may have even some drug pushers, people who don't believe, people who are lazy, don't want to do nothing. We want to keep them hidden. But guess what? The Bible doesn't do it. See, Matthew is a Jew writing to a Jewish audience. You think that he will want to put the best foot forward for Jesus. But that's not the way that God does it. He wants us to see, even in Jesus' family tree, there are relatives who are sinful, who are shameful, who are embarrassing. And so the Bible doesn't keep the door shut on the skeletons in Jesus' family closet. Because God even shows us those that like, ooh, you mean, I didn't know he was in Jesus' line. Yes. So let's look. Let's start this lesson. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 through 6. We're not going to read all 17 of that because I just, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ the son of David, the son of Abraham. So you see how he makes the connection already. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. And Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot 
Hezron. Hezron. And Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Abinadad. Abinadad begot Nashon. And Nashon begot Salmon. And Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by whom who had been the wife of Uriah. Then we go on down in Jacob, down to 16 and 17. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband, there it is, of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David unto the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the cap captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. Now, so let's look at this. The cast of characters in the lineage of Jesus consists of some of the greatest people of the Bible. Now, on Joseph's side, because as I said at the top, uh, it's felt that Matthew is doing the lineage on Joseph's side, showing Jesus' connection and Luke is showing the lineage on Mary's side. In other words, somebody did the lineage on the Nelson side, uh, James Nelson, my daddy. And then somebody else show the connection of Minnie Nelson, her side of the family. And that's what they are doing. So on Joseph's side, you see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Boaz, David, Solomon, and Zerubbabel, I mean, just to name a few. On Mary's side, <laughs> she's no slouch now. Adam, Seth, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, are there just to list a few on her side. So, I mean, you would expect that, wouldn't you? When you talk about Jesus, and you would think it's some great people had to come through that. So it's no surprise that great people were used by God to achieve the greatest moment in history, which we have watered down that we supposed to rush out and shop and get gifts and presents and all that kind of stuff. We'll talk about that on, on another lesson. But this is about the birth of the Messiah, the Lamb of God who will save the world from its sins. So let's look at this. I think we got three points that we're going to look at at this lesson. Point number one, the genealogy. So what important lessons can we learn from this passage that I just got through reading? Well, first of all, these are ordinary. I said ordinary, not extraordinary. See, ha, ha, ha. this is what we got to understand. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Woo, say it, Geneva. These are ordinary men and women like you and me. They like us. We also understand that God uses ordinary people for his divine purpose. You remember uh, 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 last week's lesson, we talked about the vessel. God called to be a vessel. And what's on the inside of us is way more important than us because we are clay, easily broken imperfect. You remember that lesson? I, I hope you did, God. I mean, I shoot, I thought that's a pretty decent lesson there. So, but he uses us. He empowers us, encourages us, and use us for his divine purpose so that we can see and others can see him in us because it's not about us. It's about what's inside. Remember, I even had a Pepsi out here. I wish I had it right now. I had a Pepsi can and I had a bottle of water. And I said to you, it's what's on the inside that is valuable. The water, the Pepsi, or whatever's on the, in the container is what we want. And so... It's not about us again. God uses us for his divine purpose.
So the Jewish genealogy generally named only the fathers. Now watch this. Watch this. But Matthew broke the tradition. Why? He broke the tradition and used showed women. We're going to look at four of them, but he lists five names. And the fifth one being Mary. But we did Mary last week. So, why would Matthew break this tradition to teach us? Woo, come on. I want you to listen to me and write it down. To teach us that God is not limited by our traditions and petty prejudice. Because, you know, we prejudice. And God is not limited by that. He is not into tribal or racial issues. To him, there is no black or white. Paul said it, no black or white, no male or female, no Jew or Gentile, no rich, no poor, no educated, no uneducated, no have, no have not. No, we are all equal. All equal. All equal before God. And God is ready to use any willing, you got to catch that part, any willing person, be it male or female, young or old, because we saw he called Moses, when Moses was 80 years old, he called Samuel, and Samuel was two years old. God, I don't care. It's about God and not about us. When we can catch that, oh, then we'll be on our way. So, Matthew's genealogy establishes Jesus as the fulfillment of both the Abrahamic and Davidic covenant. Jesus' lineage proves his earthly identity that it supports his rightful place as heir to the throne of David. Now, so there it is. But before we leave, I want us to take a closer look at the four women that was used in the lineage of Jesus. First one was Tamar, because we can learn some lessons from their lives. Tamar. She was a rejected and forsaken woman. Now, you can, you can read that in Genesis 38, verses uh, 1 through 30. And I suggest that you read it. Write it down and read it. Tamar was forsaken by the people she trusted to love her. But they rejected and forsook her. Now, so the lesson that we get, some of us have been bypassed and forgotten by those who should love us most. Somebody I, I'm talking to uh, come up in a single home. Maybe your mama left or your daddy left. But those that we, some of us, under the sound of my voice, may have even been abused by the main people who should have been protecting and loving us. We may have been bypassed and forgotten by those who should have loved us most. We often perhaps feel forsaken because of the people who care for us, abused us, and then abandoned us. It could be a husband, it could be a wife, it could be children. Somebody said now in a nursing home where you can't even now go to the nursing home. And they feel rejected. But here's the good news. The forsaken is remembered by God. Woo! I don't know about y'all, but that's shouting territory for me. The forsaken is remembered by God. David put it this way, when my father and my mother have forsaken me, they gone, they left. Then the Lord woo, will take me up. And you are seeing someone whose father and mother, they are gone. They're no longer 
in this world, the land of the dying, because I'm in the land of the dying on the way to the land of the living. But there, but God has remembered me. And that's what Minnie said on her way out to me and my sister. Just before she was ready to go, she told us all of our life. We used to live right over here on 15th and Prentice Street, starting from 15th and Prentice all the way to the end of her time. She told us this, God will take care of you. Six words. And I just want you to remember that today from Tamar. God will remember and take care of you. He did it for Tamar. Then let's go to Rahab. I didn't mean to spend that much time on that, but let's go to Rahab. She was a Canaanite, a woman with a sordid past. The past was sordid and the future was uncertain. She was a prostitute. You can read her story in Joshua chapter 2. Verses 1 through 16. Read it. You know, but she demonstrated, Rahab demonstrated faith. Because when those spies came to her, her uh, place of business, she told them, we know that the God has given you this land. I know it. And there they were spying, trying to see what's what. And God has given you this land. She believed it. We had heard about your God. Remember, they had been out in the wilderness 40 years. So obviously, she only heard about. But here's the lesson. Your past is immaterial. All God wants is your availability. And Rahab was available. She said, and when you come and take the city, just remember me and my family. And the good news is Christ came into our world of hopelessness. Never have I seen so many people walking the streets. You know, is there a TV show called uh, mm, The Walking Dead? And I've never seen so many. They, they talking about zombies. Well, guess what? We got some zombies. Look around. You got some walking dead, some zombies. People who have no life, no hope. But we got, we've got the answer. Uh, and so Christ came into our world of hopelessness to give us hope and joy in place of sorrow. Healing and life in place of sickness and death. Woo! When we think of that, that's why he came. Then we can really rejoice, say joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let me go on to Ruth. I, I, I thought I'd be through with this kind of quickly, but you know. <laughs> but now let's go to Ruth. Ruth. If Rahab was a Canaanite, Ruth is a Moabite. And the Bible said that God felt like the Moabites were nothing but garbage. That's my garbage. But, ooh, but God doesn't hold that. So she's a Moabite, a foreigner to the commonwealth of Israel. And she's a young widow. You can read, go on over to the book of Ruth, and you can read the book of Ruth in probably an hour. But, and here's what Ruth did, because when Naomi was going back to Bethlehem, see, see, there you go. Ooh, we may have to, I may have to write a note, and we do that uh, as a series next year, uh, the book of Ruth, because that, 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 that's, that's a great book there. Now, but Ruth, but see, wait a minute, wait a minute. Naomi left Bethlehem called the House of Bread to go to Moab. She did it because Elimelech, her husband, said, we're going we gonna to leave. They left the House of Bread to go to Moab, and God said, that's garbage. Woo! Which one of us will leave our home and leave a house of bread and go out there 
and eat out of a garbage can. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. I ain't gonna do it. No, no. I'm not saying that I get, <laughs> I'm living out on the streets, I'm mad eat out of God, but I'm not gonna walk out of my house, the house of bread, and go eat out of a garbage can. No, no. So, but here's what Ruth did. She took up a new citizenship through marriage, accepted God and the people of Naomi because she said, where thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodge, I will lodge. Your people be my people and your God will be my God. Woo! Teach Geneva. So this is, this is similar to our spiritual heritage. We can have a new citizenship. We can have a new home. Uh, all of that. We can accept Jesus, the good news, we can accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And in accepting the country of Jesus, which is heaven, we accept his people who are born again. And guess what? Now you're on your way to victory. Then the fourth woman was Bathsheba. She was the wife of Uriah. And this woman was exploited by a king and lost her husband. And you can read that in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 through 9. You know that she was taking a bath, and you know these Bible scholars that said, well, she knew that David was up there, she taking a bath on the rooftop. That's why they took a bath. But David should have been with his army. They want to look down and say, well, she knew. No. Nah. David sent for her. She didn't send for David. Anyway, you know, he called her, had her, had a one night stand with her. Yes, that's what he did. And I'm saying this because, okay, okay, stay on track, Geneva. And then she got pregnant. And then when she got pregnant, David sent for her husband and wanted her husband to go and sleep with his wife so that uh, he could, she could say, okay, he the father, but you know all that didn't work out. Go read the Bible. Read the Bible. Stop looking at the young and the rest is bold and beautiful. Read the Bible. But the lesson from this, God sees all, knows all. Now watch this word, and yet, and yet, he still loves us and will bless us. That's the lesson that you need to learn from Bathsheba. And the good news is this, God is not like man and hold our past against us. The past stays in the past. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. That's good, that's good, that's good. So when we take a closer look at all of the characters that are listed in the ancestry of Jesus, there are some unlikely people included in the list. But let me just say this. Even the great heroes had strikes against them. Are you ready? Abraham lied. And then I said Abraham was a pimp. Abraham was a pimp. Go read your Bible. He pimped out his wife. A Jacob stole. Moses disobeyed. And he was a killer too. Miriam criticized. Samson lusted. Peter cursed. John wanted to call fire down on unbelievers. But guess what? We all have flaws. None of us are perfect. We all fall short of the glory of God. That's what Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So no one is smart enough. No one is impressive enough. No one is what? Strong enough, good enough. No one is without some shame, failure, brokenness, inability. None of us lack credentials. If we did, they, they still wouldn't be good enough. Because Ephesians 2 and 9 said, 
not a works, we are not saved, not a works lest any man should boast. And all believe me, if we could, we would boast. Oh, yes, we would. So that's the genealogy of Jesus. Now, so we talked about generations. And all I want to say about the generations, because we divided up the generations, divide into three divisions of 14 generations each. Uh, and, the, and the three divisions are explained in Matthew chapter 1, verse 17. And when we look at these, this, what we see is the faithfulness of God in spite of the unfaithfulness of man. Woo! Ah, oh, that's good. We see the faithfulness of God in spite of the unfaithfulness of man. Because Jeremiah he put it this way in Lamentations uh, uh, 323. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. And this morning when I got up, I didn't have yesterday's mercies. I got new mercies. Because you see, if you remember, there is a time uh, uh, when we look at these three divisions in the first division, we went from Abraham to David. Well, you know, David, he, he cut a fool and some of the others did, too. But God was still faithful. The second group of uh, judges came up. We had judges. And, and, and in fact, the book of Judges said that man did what was right in their own eyesight. And in fact, this second group, it, it stops. It ends up in Babylon. And then we see, uh, and God was faithful to them in Babylon. And in the third division of, of these uh, uh, generations, then <clears throat> we see him through the captivity to Jesus Christ. But yet God was faithful to them. And, and I'm telling you, going back again, when Jeremiah said, great is thy faithfulness. And that takes us right into point number three. We did point one was the genealogy. Point two was the generations. And point three is God is great and God is good. Because when Jeremiah said, great is thy faithfulness, that's a great segue into the God is great and God is good. And that's the first blessing that many of us uh, were taught. God is great and God is good, and we thank him for our food. By his hand we all be fed. Give us, Lord, our daily bread. Whew. So, I, I, look, I ain't going to apologize for getting excited. I get excited every week. Y'all to be used to me by now. We've been, what, on this air almost three years, so y'all be used to me by now. But God is great. And God is good. Look at, <clears throat> we at Hebrews now. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. Reading from the New King James Version. God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days, and we in the last days, my sister and brother, spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed thirty as heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. That's how come. Uh, maybe that's next week's lesson. Ah, okay, I won't get into next week's lesson. But when you, Jesus said, when you've seen him, you've seen God because he is the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, 
as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name uh, than they. For to which of the angels did he, uh, that's God, ever say, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. God is great. God is good. Now, why God spoke, that's the first thing that we said, that we are told. He spoke. God speaks. I wish the Lord would talk to me. I've heard some people say, I wish the Lord would talk to me. He's talking. You're just not listening. God spoke to Adam and told him that the, world, that the Savior will come from the seed of the woman. And you can read that. Make a note. Read it in Genesis 3.15. He spoke to Abraham and told him that the Savior will come from his seed. You can read that in Genesis 12.3 and Genesis 18.18 18 and Genesis 22.18. He spoke to Jacob and told him that the Savior will come from the tribe of Judah. You can read that in Genesis 49, 10. He spoke to David and told him that the Savior would be born of his house, meaning coming through your line. And that's 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 13. To Michael, who was a prophet, he spoke to him and told him that the Savior would be born in Bethlehem. That's Michael 5 and 2. And go and read that because it said, oh, Ephrata, Bethlehem, you are the smallest of all. See, uh, when we did that Jesus and the disinherited, that series, you see how Jesus always connected to the small thing. He not, boom. We like big things. Jesus said, I'm not about that. Even though he can do the big things. And when he does the big things, we don't believe it no way. To Isaiah, God spoke to Isaiah and told him that the Savior would be born of a virgin. And that's in Isaiah chapter, chapter 7, verse 14. But I challenge you to go on back to the very beginning of Verse of, of seven, of Isaiah seven. So God spoke and he spoke in different ways. He spoke to Moses in a great thundering voice in the midst of a storm. Read it. Exodus 19, 19, Deuteronomy 5, 22. He spoke to Elijah by a still small voice. Read it, 1 Kings 19 and 12. He spoke to Elijah in a vision. Read it, Elijah 1.1. 1, 1. He spoke to Samuel in a dream. Read it, 1 Samuel 3.5. And I told you, Samuel wasn't nothing but a little boy. God is great. Point four, I, I, I see, point four, greater. I forgot. I was thinking that was subdivision, but that's all right. Greater. The sun. Whoops. Now, let me say this about the sun, and then give me about 10 minutes. I'll be through. Oops, if I got 10 minutes. I got 10 minutes. No one in Scripture is prophet priest and king no one but jesus those offices did not overlap yeah sometimes there was somebody could be a prophet and a priest but they wasn't a king and the king couldn't do the work of the priest and the priest uh, he didn't do the work of the prophet unless he was a prophet but jesus is the only one who was prophet, priest, and king. Prophet. He was the spokesman for God. In other words, he went to the people on the behalf of God. 
if you remember, the prophets would say, thus said the Lord. But Jesus, when he was teaching, when he came, we see him in the New Testament. What does he say? He said, you've heard of old that it was said, but I'll say, woo, God the mighty. See, we need to read. He said, but I say. So he was the supreme spokesman of God. In fact, he was the word of God. Now, the priest, the priest, he was the spokesman for the people. In other words, he went to God on the behalf of the people. You see, the prophet went to the people on the behalf of God and said, this is what the Lord said. And the priest went to God on behalf of the people and said, this is what the people are crying about. Now, the priests, I need to take just a moment here. You need to listen to me and get your pencil, start writing if you need to. The priests' main job was to make sacrifice. He made sacrifice. Now, let, let me just tell you what the priests. The priests, the, 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 the temple, the tabernacle, had three parts. You had the outer court. And in the outer court, to get into the outer court, you come by way of the bronze altar. That was the altar of sacrifice. And it was going 24-7. Before you could come in, you had to make sacrifice. And like you get ready to go into your church, come into St. Stephen, there's a big altar. And I had to bring a, a, a dove, a pigeon, a lamb, a goat, a bullock, a cow, a sheep, or something before getting in the door. Some of them don't even want to give a sacrifice of praise. Don't want to give a sacrifice of offering. But before you could come in, you had to give a sacrifice. And the priest did it. That was the outer court. But then there was the, there was the uh, a holy place. That's where we talked about Zechariah a couple of weeks ago. That's where Zechariah was when, when Gabriel the angel showed. Because in the holy place, nobody went in there but the priests, and they only went in there to do their duty. There were three things, three pieces of furniture in the holy place. That was the table that had the showbread. There was the lampstick where the, the, the priest had to keep the lamps trimmed and burning. Then at the table, they would change the bread every seven days. And then there was the altar of incense where they had to strike it up and keep the smoke going up. That was symbolic of the saints' prayers going up to heaven. That's when Gabriel was on the right side of the altar of incense. And it sat right in front of a veil, because there was a veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies place. And that veil is what Jesus, when he died, rent from top to bottom, not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom. So that, because see, nobody went into the holy of holies, but the high priest. He had to make sacrifice on the outside, catch the blood, because you had to make a sacrifice. Then they tie a rope around him, because if he went into the Holy of the Holies and the sacrifice wasn't accepted by God and God struck him dead, couldn't nobody go in there and get him, so they had to pull him out. He had little bell tassels at the bottom of his robe. As long as they could hear the ding, ding, ding of the bell, they knew he was still walking around in there doing what he had to do. But understand, understand this. Notice there was only the ark, only two pieces of furniture. I didn't say that. Only two pieces of furniture that was in the Holy of Holies. That was Ark of the Covenant. You probably say that's only one. Ah, the Ark of the Covenant. And on the top, it's the mercy seat. Woo! Taste Geneva. 
You see, you had, we want to claim that as one piece, but the Ark of the Covenant, the bottom part, but on the top where those angels were bowing is the, is the mercy seat. And once the high priest sprinkled that, he had to come on out of there. Now notice, in the holies of holy, and the holy place, something I did not say, because I said there was the lamb, there was the lampstand, there was the table, and there was the uh, altar of incense at the holy place, and only the ark of the covenant, and the mercy seat, and the holies of holies. I didn't say anything about there being a seat, a chair, because it didn't have it. Because when the priest got through, get on up out of here. It, in other words, his job, because he had to come back and do it again. But our high priest, look what it says. Look what it says. Woo. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I, when he had, now look what it said. When he had by himself purged our sins. What do you mean purged our sin? Free someone. Or something from unwanted qualities, our feelings, our condition. When he cleansed, rid, atoned, or wiped out our sin, he sat down. Woo! At the right hand of the majesty on high. He sat down. Why? Because when he sat out there on the cross of Calvary, it is finished. It's through. Nothing else needs to be done. Nothing else. God's plan of salvation is finished. And he took his seat and sat down. Notice, he sat at the right hand of the Father. And that's where he is today to make intercession for you and me. Then, whew. Ah, then he's the king. He's prophet, priest, king. He, and the king, he's the sustainer of the universe. Everything is held together by his power. By his power. The sun comes up in the morning, don't come up at night. It's all done by his power. And Jesus Christ is the appointed heir of all things. Jesus Christ inherited all power in heaven and earth. If you believe that, why worry about COVID-19? He's got the power. Jesus Christ inherited the authority to execute all judgment upon men. If you believe that, why worry about Donald Trump, Mitch McConnell? I said ditch Mitch and dump Trump, but guess what? I know who holds control. I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. Okay, Jesus Christ inherited the lordship over both the dead and the living. Jesus Christ inherited the whole universe, a new heaven, an earth, and a new world capital. Jesus Christ inherited all government, an eternal government. It'll never pass away. Jesus Christ inherited all power and riches, wisdom and strength, honor and glory and blessings. It's his. Jesus Christ inherited the name above every name. And every knee shall bow before him, vindicating his claim to be both Lord and Savior. Now, here are the good news as I get ready to say bye-bye. We are joint heirs with him. Because it said, Jesus Christ inherited the name above. I got a new name. I got a new name. You know me as Geneva. But I got a new name over in glory. And it's man, man, all man. And one day, I'm going to take my seat. And I'm going to be sitting right near the throne. Because not only he's an heir, I'm a joint heir in Christ Jesus. See you next week.